Um, hey everyone, so today we're, we're lucky to have um, David Krofczyk from the Very Department lucky. of Physics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, David, I think you're mainly nuclear. Nuclear physics, physics yeah. that's right. And um, there, are, there are two big particle detectors at the LHC, there's ATLAS and CMS, and David's part of the CMS collaboration, so I guess you spent quite a bit of time over there and all that, so... And of you. All right, Josh, thank you very much. Thank you. Apologies for being late. That's the price you pay when you teach in one part of the campus and run to the other part. But then you know that when you take courses on one lecture in one part of the campus and you have to run to the other part of the campus. You know exactly what it's like. Um, okay. New Zealand and nuclear physics don't go together, right? And, and so 17 years ago when my wife and I, my wife's a Kiwi, we moved here, and I came here to pick up this job at the University of Auckland. They were looking for a physical oceanographer. I am not a physical oceanographer, but I do know how to teach electronics, and that's what they really wanted, a physical oceanographer who could teach electronics. They couldn't find one, so they phoned me back and said, well, would you reconsider and come down? So that's how you get nuclear physics into New Zealand. You come down under <laughs> false pretenses. <laughs> but because I'm here, New Zealand is in a major collaboration, an international collaboration in a huge particle and nuclear physics facility in Geneva, Switzerland. Have you been to Geneva? Who's been to Geneva? Anybody? Nobody's been to Geneva. I thought Kiwis were travelers. Anyway. You're too bad for us. <laughs> I'll have to be. Um, so you can see we're about... Um, okay, so you can see we're about um, exactly halfway around the planet, literally halfway around the planet from, um, where is it, from <clears throat> Geneva to Auckland. So it doesn't matter which way you go, however I recommend going through Singapore and then Zurich rather than through the States because you will always get a hard time in the States. So, and, and I say that as an American, so um, take that other route through Singapore. All right, so we're involved in nuclear physics at Geneva, and we have colleagues at Canterbury University uh, who are interested in medical physics, medical technology, so I was able to put them together with my interest in just basic research in nuclear physics, and we were able to put together a national group. So we had Canterbury in the south and Auckland in the north, and as far as the, the, the Center for European Particle Nuclear Physics Research, CERN Laboratory, uh, is concerned, that's all they see. They see a nation. They see two institutions representing a nation. So we are New Zealand, and well, essentially I am Auckland, and there are a couple of guys in Canterbury. But the Canterbury people who do a wonderful job. They're the ones who are currently supporting us, supporting the grant. They hold a medical physics imaging grant right now, and that's what kept us going through 10 years of collaboration with uh, the laboratory in Geneva. So I held a first five years grant, they held the second five years grant. Okay, um, what are we doing? We're doing particle and nuclear physics, and, you, and if you've been reading the newspapers in the past month, early July, something very unusual came up in the news. And People at Geneva um, arrived very early in a lecture theater, kind of 200-seat lecture theater, one of these big lecture theaters. The night before, lines were coming out the door, and it and, and, and wasn't the police, but it was les pompiers, the firemen, who are in charge of security. Switzerland, so you have firemen in charge of security, and let people in. And so at about 5.35 in the morning, this is what, what people were doing. What were they waiting for there? And then when people came and, and, and the special guest speakers came, they stayed at the seminar, and, and everybody's looking up in the air at something. What are they looking at? Two different groups here. There's, there's, here's Fabiola. She's um, the group leader for the other large experiment, the ATLAS experiment. And this is, this is Josephine Candela. He's professor of physics at UC Santa Barbara. He's in charge of our collaboration. And these collaborations are on the order of 3,000 scientists and engineers per group. So you're looking at two people here representing 6,000 scientists and engineers. And then you add on to that another couple of thousand students, PhD, masters, 
bachelor's degree students, and you've got almost approaching, you know, a huge mass of people, small town here, two small towns. And this fellow in the middle is uh, Ralph Hoyer, who is the director of the CERN laboratory, and something's captured their attention. Uh, now they're all standing and cheering. Why are they applauding? Sounds fun, <laughs> and they're still applauding. They're still applauding five minutes later. They're still applauding. Vindication of the standard model. Vindication of the standard model. That they landed a rover last That was at, that happened after this. This was a very good year. 2012 is a very good year for science, and it's still going on. But that's very good. Well, somebody should talk about that later on. Um, by the way, keep your eye open for this man. That with the white hair, the long white hair. We'll see him again. All right, and then who gets the credit? No, 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 no. No, thank you. No, I don't really know. The man on the right is Peter Higgs, and the man on the left is um, George Brew. But 1964, these two gentlemen, along with the third gentleman who has passed away, put together an idea, a very crazy idea. Um, Oh, and I wanted to mention that um, Peter Higgs, for me, it was really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime. What? What has happened in his lifetime? So 1960, now the 1964 starts. And, and, and in 1964, these two gentlemen, along with a third, put together a model of the way we could approach an unanswered question in, in particle and nuclear physics. That is, how do things get heavy? How do things get their kilograms, right? Kilograms is a unit of mass. Weight, how much you weigh, is different from kilograms, the amount of mass you have. Because if I have 10 kilograms, if I weigh, or if I weigh 70 kilograms here, or I have 70 kilograms of mass here, and so I will have some weight, mass times acceleration, and acceleration due to gravity, about 10 meters per second squared, so I would have <laughs> 70 times 10, I would have about 700 newtons. That's the terminology of weight. But if I went to the moon, the gravity is only one sixth of what it is on Earth, so I would have 700 divided by six, so 120 some, whatever it is, 116 newtons. So I'd have a lot fewer newtons in weight on the moon than I would have on Earth. But I would still have 70 kilograms of mass, the same amount of mass. And if I was, if they, th on the way back from the moon, they threw me out of the rocket ship and I was floating in space, and it was approximately no gravity, I'm freely floating in, 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 like in the space station, people float around in the space station where there's not much gravity, not much gravitational attraction, um, then you still have 70 kilograms, even though there's, the gravitational fields are balanced out from the moon and the sun and the earth. You still have mass, you don't have weight, you're weightless, but you still have 70 kilograms of substance, of stuff. Where does that stuff come from? Is this stuff, is there a fundamental unit of stuff? You know, there are electric charges. We have electrons, if you think back to chemistry, there are electrons and they come in unit charges, some, some, some funny unit of charge. But one electron's worth of charge is exactly the same for every single electron that we know of in the universe, that we can tell, going back to Professor Easter's universe uh, 13.7 billion years ago. So is, a, is, is there a unit of mass that's fundamental like the unit of electric charge appears to be? And that's the question that our standard model of particle physics, as it's grandly called, will try to address. And no one was really able to come up with a nice answer. But just asking that question is the kind of question that <laughs> Professor Easter addressed when he talked about the beginning of the early universe and multiple universes and, and fine-tuning of all the constants in the universe. Um, so physicists like to pretend that we're, we're asking deep, meaningful questions by using uh, experiments. And so we can ask um, from a nice painting, where are we coming from, and what are we, and where are we going, and 
Why are, why are things the way they are? All right, so we have a standard model. We have a standard picture, which is a set of mathematical equations that have been developed over the past 100 years, 150 years, going back to James Clerk Maxwell, who unified electricity and magnetism. And these equations allow us to predict what happens when two particles of matter interact with each other. And they can do this prediction with extreme accuracy. All right. So we're, there's, this, there's this model, and we don't, some of the constants of the model uh, have to be measured by experiment. We can't derive them yet from first principles. So there's this model of how matter and forces seem to work, and we'll, we'll come on to this a little more. Um, but there's still questions of, of, about this, the applicability of this model and why can't we calculate some things that we think are basic, like the size of an electric charge, for example. Why does it have the value it has? Why isn't it three times that value? And why is the value of mass? Is there some fundamental unit of mass that we're all made out of? Uh, okay, and we'll have a look at CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, which is where I New Zealand does this work in collaboration with the, a group called the Compact Muon Solenoid. Compact is a relative term, as we'll see. So we ask questions like particle and nuclear physics. Um, what's the early universe like? Where's all the matter in the universe? It doesn't seem like there's enough matter to hold the galaxies together. They spin too fast. Because if you look through a telescope, you see bright lights and you see spiral arms on a galaxy. And if you add up all the matter and all the light you see from that galaxy, it turns out there's not enough matter to have that galaxy maintain its shape as it rotates. There's some invisible matter. There's some dark matter. You may have heard that term, dark matter. Yeah. What, what is the margin of error for these kind of minimal. measurements when they... Minimal. Because you, what's measured is the rotation speed of the galaxy the stars, individual stars in the galaxy. And this, this is measured to very high accuracy, smaller than the uncertainty in the theoretical models. <laughs> so they can measure much more accurately than they can predict how much mass uh, should be there. So they can measure the velocity of the stars within kilometers per second. And, and they're traveling tens of thousands of kilometers per second. So there's just a very tiny uncertainty in these mass measurements, the rotation of the galaxies, the rotation of the velocity of the stars in the galaxies, very, very tiny errors. This is one place where theory, uh, experiment is ahead of theory. Okay, So we know that there's stars are moving, and if there was just the mass that we saw in those stars, just the kilograms we saw, those stars would just keep on going. They wouldn't hold together. So somehow, there must be extra matter, dark matter, that exists that we can't see with our normal standard model picture. It must interact in some other way that we don't yet understand. And this is what's one of the things that keeps us humble, or it should, because this standard model picture, we can explain about maybe 4% of all the matter that we can, there must be in the universe. We can add up all the stars we see and add up all the glowing gas from the dust in between the stars and we can add up all of the mass that we see in the visible universe and that represents only about four percent of what theory says we must have in order to keep the universe looking the way it does. Right? The other 25 or 26 percent is this dark matter. That's what it takes to hold, that's, that's how much mass you take, need to add into the galaxy to hold it together as it rotates. And there's just been a Nobel Prize last year for um, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And there's a type of dark energy which makes up most of the energy of the universe. And that's making the universe, after the Big Bang, it expanded, then it floated out for about five billion years, and then after five billion years it started to accelerate. Very odd behavior. That acceleration, the Nobel Prize was given for that acceleration, and so, or, or for the measurement of that acceleration. Again, experiment, way ahead of theory. So that's 70% of the missing energy in the universe. So this standard model, we just know a whole lot about it, but 
we know a whole lot about very little. A whole lot about just 4%. The other 96% is absolute mystery. But at the Large Hadron Collider, we're trying to address this dark matter question by looking for missing energy and collisions. We, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, we, there are other embarrassing problems, like if there's matter in the universe and there was nothing to start off with, there must have been some kind of antimatter at the beginning so that the net electric charge was zero in the universe, but somehow all the antimatter has disappeared and we're left with us. Where's the other half of the universe? We don't know where it is. Why do we have substance? Why do we have mass in the first place? That's a question we can ask about the matter that's left over. This is tiny little 4% that's left over and the tiny little 4% that is matter, not antimatter. Okay, so we'll look at these kind of physics points, we'll see what New Zealand does, and, and we'll look at the stuff that physicists want to know. And that means plots of data that come out of um, these complicated, large experiments that take thousands of people. Okay, particle accelerators. Um, this is what, this is the main tool, the Large Hadron Collider is a giant particle accelerator. And what this does is accelerate protons to some obscene number close to the speed of light, 99.9999991% of the speed of light. And when something goes really fast, you can think that it has a lot of energy. All right, any object going really fast has a lot of energy. So it turns out that um, over the years, scientists have related energy to different properties of matter. So the higher energy um, we have, this, it turns out that st that means we can penetrate smaller and smaller regions inside an atom. If we look at the very high energy probe of particles, we can essentially, as that energy gets higher, the, our we get finer and finer probes of matter, the ability to probe on smaller scales. So uh, the accelerators are very powerful micros microscopes. Um, we, can just, we can look for new particles for our standard model, and that's, that was the hit in July, um, because very high energy was, is related to something called, what that Einstein called mass. And uh, a fellow you may not be as familiar with, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann told us that energy is proportional to temperature. So as we go to higher and higher energies with our particle accelerator, we go to higher and higher temperatures. And that's interesting because as you go back in time toward the Big Bang, you reach higher and higher temperatures and higher and higher densities of energy. So take all the energy in the universe and squeeze it together. It's going to get hot as you get closer and closer together. Yes. Um, uh, how does energy relate to space in the absence of matter? Because people talk about this dark energy and the expansion of right. space. Energy doesn't have to be matter. Energy could be a field, like an electric field. Going through us right now, we have lights on so we can see each other. That's light bouncing off of us and into our into our retina, into our eyes, and our brain interprets it as people sitting around us. But that light is energy. It's a form of energy. It's just a form of energy that we can see right now. There are other forms of electromagnetic energy that we can't see, like infrared. We can't see in the infrared with our normal eyes. We can't see high frequency waves, like radio waves, like an FM radio station. We can't see the waves of light going through. So there are other sources of energy other than just the kilograms that go into matter, like Einstein said, where that energy is proportional to matter. So we can have what we think is empty, we can have, but that, but that empty space of matter can have energy, it can have electromagnetic field energy, um, it can have, what we're going to see something called a Higgs field energy, and it can have an energy from little fluctuations, quantum mechanical fluctuations that two particles appear and then they immediately disappear. So is there some kind of field proposed as the energy source that causes space to expand or...? Yes, there's some kind of repulsive field, apparently, 
Because this is where the experiment is ahead of the theory that says that this is what's making the universe accelerate. There's some kind of extra field in the universe that is giving a repulsive push and making the universe accelerate. That was the experimental discovery. The theory that explains it is way behind. This could be some kind of field that we don't understand yet. Because we barely found out about this field we're talking about today called the matter field, the Higgs field. All right, so these, these accelerators are, 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 and if anybody wants a clarification or something, please just just go right ahead. Just fire away. Well, I haven't done physics since so. Okay, well, I'll try to, I'll try to aim at you then, <laughs> right? And, and I'll do my best. So there are particle accelerators. They make particles go faster. Particles are, if you think of electrons, remember protons? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we need. And... <laughs> So we work at a proton accelerator at the Large Hadron Collider, and it's a collider. It's not an accelerator that shoots protons into a fixed target. It is a machine that has protons going clockwise and in protons going counterclockwise, and these are, are timed so that they will collide head-on at fixed locations around the ring, and that's where we build the detectors. Of course, the detectors are built there, and then the accelerator was designed and timed perfectly so that the proton bunches would collide where the detectors are located, right? And they'll collide head-on, and that's a lot of energy colliding head-on. Think of two automobiles crashing together head-on. It's a very violent collision compared to two automobiles that just kind of scrape side off each other and have a good glazing collision. Our goal is to smash them together as hard as we can head-on, and we turn all of that energy, the energy of motion, possibly into this kind of energy, mass. That's um, the idea. This is probably a lecture of a course order itself, but yes. how do you get one program to go that way and add force to it, and another program to go that way and add force to it, and yet have them on the same trajectory? We'll see this in, in a handful of slides. Awesome. We'll see this. <laughs> <laughs> what is mass? Isaac Newton told us, if you, Look in the Principia, there's a sentence that says, the quantity of matter is the measure of the same arising from its density and its bulk conjointly. What I think that means is density times volume equals mass. So you have kilograms per cubic meter, and you multiply that by volume, which is cubic meters, and the cubic meters cancel out, and you're left with kilograms on top. That was his definition of matter. Density times volume, whatever you have there, is matter. The other definition is one I, we've already looked at, E equals mc squared, from Albert Einstein. But from Albert Einstein, what all he said in his famous paper in 1905, where this formula was actually written, was actually written as energy divided by c squared, which is this term, for some reason he called energy L. There must be, anybody speak German? Is there any word in German that means energy that begins with the letter L? No, no word. I have no idea why you used L. So, this is energy, this is the speed of light squared. And what's left over is mass. But it was written in this form so that you get kinetic energy, energy of motion, one half mv squared. Okay, if a body gives off energy, like a hot piece of metal radiates <clears throat> heat energy, then it will, he says, it will lose mass by the amount of energy it radiates divided by the speed of light squared. That's all he says in his paper. We, had, in, in our age, have turned it around to E equals mass times speed of light squared. Now, both of these gentlemen... So C is the speed of light as well? C is the speed of light, yes. He called it capital V. I call it, we call it little c today. And we call E for energy instead of L. If the mass doesn't exist in a vacuum, do you have to re-portion C? Like if what doesn't exist? If, if the mass isn't interacting with the vacuum, the C is the speed of light in the vacuum. Yes, but hardly at all. There's 
speed of light in the atmosphere is just a minuscule lot slower than it is in the vacuum of the space. And in fact, light, when it goes through glass or any material, slows down. Okay, that's that's because the electromagnetic field of the light interacts with the electric fields of the atoms in the glass, and it acts, the light acts as if it slows down. In fact, it acts as if it gains mass. It's another way that Peter Higgins likes to explain his mechanism of generating mass, but I didn't want to talk about that. Um, but that's a good question, actually. So you don't have to make a correction because the correction is so tiny. In practical purposes, it's so tiny. But you're right, it does change. Speed of light does change. So both of these famous names in physics, we had to name two people in physics. It would be Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. And you might not be able to name anybody else, but that's okay, neither can I. No one said what mass is. Newton said it was just what's left over when you have the density and the volume multiplied together. And, and you get mass. And Einstein said, well, it's... it's the amount of it, it, it's the amount of energy that gets lost that makes you lose some mass by having energy radiated away. He didn't say neither one of them said what mass is, and that was one of the problems that's been dogging physics for over 400 years, 400 years at least. What is mass? 1964, Higgs and and, and actually five others, two other groups and Peter Higgs. So there's a group of two, a group of three, and Peter Higgs. Um, they all are working and they all go to the same seminars, they all go to the same colloquia, they all go to the same conferences. They have the ideas in the air that there must be a new mechanism that tells us what mass is. So it's, it's not just density times volume, there must be something fundamental in, in the nature that makes mass. What is it? And, and they all kind of hit on the same idea at the same time. Um, but Peter Higgs had a slight edge that we'll get to in a minute. And, and we have this idea now um, called the Higgs mechanism. This is the new, it's a very shocking idea, that, um, and it was since 1964, so that's, that's new for theoretical physics sometimes, um, because we haven't been able to verify this or falsify this. 1964 prediction until 2012. All right, so 48 years have gone by since the original for formation of this model. And British politician asked somebody at Imperial College in London, how can you explain this mechanism to me? Why should we spend so many billions of pounds to build a particle accelerator in Geneva to search for this this, this, this Higgs mechanism, how can you explain it to me on one page? And this is what won that gentleman a, a, a box of champagne from the minister. Imagine you have a room full of guests, a room full of journalists. And at the time, um, the, the celebrity, the celebrity at the time was Margaret Thatcher. Remember Margaret Thatcher? Some of you are probably old enough to remember Margaret. I remember Margaret Thatcher. So the idea was that this person uh, at Imperial College said, okay, and, it, and I thank uh, Dan Miller at the University College London for this nice canonical slides that everybody shows. Here's Margaret Thatcher appearing in the room. Now notice she's not there, but then when she is there, she gets surrounded by uh, journalists. And they cram in on her, and she can't move very fast anymore. Outside the room, she's moving at the speed of light. She's walking really quickly. She wants to get to the buffet table. That was the idea. She wants to get to the buffet table the other side of the room. But as soon as she enters the room, she gets swarmed in by journalists who impede her progress. They slow her down. They, so she acts, she's acting as if she has mass. Right? As she walks into the room, she gets surrounded. She can't make forward progress very much. She can still move forward toward the buffet table, but she acts as if she's gained mass. And so the Higgs field is what is slowing down Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, the Higgs field is this 
group of journalists who are uniformly spread throughout the room, or, put it in Peter Higgs parlance, it's spread through all of space and time. There is this invisible field spreading it through all of space and time. Didn't Aristotle have something like this called yeah, quintessence? <laughs> yes, well, virtual journalists, they fluctuate in and out of existence, but they do this so, so, so quickly that you don't notice them. Okay, she's acquired mass. And in fact, different people, some are more or less famous than Mrs. Thatcher, will get surrounded by different amounts of the Higgs field. If you're more famous than Mrs. Thatcher, you would be surrounded by even more, but at the time, there was nobody else more famous. So she was the heaviest particle of the lot. But if you were a little electron, or if you were me, and you were walking through these journalists, you would hardly be deflected at all, or hardly be stopped at all, and I'd go straight to the buffet table. So I'd maintain a very low mass, like an electron, for example. So while Mrs. Thatcher might be a top quark, which has an incredibly heavy mass, it's an elementary particle, I would be an electron, one of the lightest mass particles. Okay? And this breaks the symmetry that outside the room of the journalists, outside here, everybody's moving as fast as they can, everybody's moving at the speed of light to get to the buffet table. It's just that the more famous people get surrounded by the Higgs field, the journalists, they slow down more, and the less famous people gain less mass because there are fewer journalists. I might have one journalist grab me by the arm just because he's a keen me and he wants to talk about, you know, going back and where we grew up and stuff like that in, in, in Auckland. Actually, I didn't grow up here through that age. So I would just have this one, one guy and might have just a, a mass of an electron, but we both get over to the buffet table at the time while the food was still there. Did you have a question? Okay. So, this breaks the symmetry. Outside the room, everybody's, and before, just right after the Big Bang, all the particles are massless. All the particles are massless as the universe inflates. Okay, and then as it inflates, it cools down, just like hot objects do when they expand, they cool off, and suddenly the mass symmetry breaks, and the particles that were moving at the speed of light, the Higgs field kicks in, and some particles gain a lot of mass, some particles only gain a little mass. Other particles called photons don't have any mass at all. They're, com they're like the people who come and clean up after the party. Nobody notices them. They just go right through, back and forth at the speed of light. So they maintain the speed of light. The Higgs particle is an excited portion of this Higgs field. So if you take these journalists... So what are the journalists at the moment? The journalists are... Um, like, um, they are like electric charges that are sensitive to a part of the standard, one of the forces of nature, called the weak force. They don't respond to, um, uh, grab, well, let's see, how can I say this? The journalists, the journalists represent a field. Uh, I'm just trying to get something uniform, all right? And, and journalists just, just came to mind because that's what they look like here. Um, they, they react to a type of charge that's not an electric charge, uh, but there's another type of charge in the standard model to which they do react. And, and particles have this additional characteristic. It's less well known, but it exists in the standard model. And so these journalists react to that special charge, that mass kind of charge that particles seem to carry. Okay? And the size of that interaction, the size of that mass charge, it's called the mass coupling to the Higgs field, determines how much you gain in mass. If the coupling is strong to that char mass charge, you gain a lot of kilograms if you are, you know, if you're a quark, for example. If you're an electron, your mass charge is very weak. The coupling is weak, so you don't gain as much kilograms. So when, as particle moves through, as particles move through, it depends on what their mass charge is. So there will be more leaflets on different planets? No. Elementary particles are the same on every planet. 
because we can tell that by looking through telescopes and we see the same chemistry going on in the atmosphere. Say in Jupiter, we can, we can see the same chemical elements. So we know that physics is the same all over the universe, the visible universe that we can see. It's just that some things we don't understand, like dark matter, dark energy, but the matter that we can see, this 4%, all that's physics is the same. The standard model explains all of the physics that goes on there. Just kind of, kind of an interesting idea that the physics that's happening here is also happening 10 billion light years away in some distant galaxy because we can see the starlight from that galaxy, analyze the starlight, and deduce what chemical elements are in there, in, in those stars. And they're just the same kind of chemical elements that we have on Earth. So the same physical processes must be in play in those far, far away galaxies. Okay? This is a Higgs boson. M hey, Margaret Thatcher doesn't come in, but somebody just says, Yo, Mrs. Thatcher's on the way! And the journalists themselves get excited. And so they form a little clump in the Higgs field. That little clump is what we'll call a Higgs particle. The, the, a simple, it's the simplest excitation of the Higgs field. It doesn't take a Margaret Thatcher or any type of particle to cause it to happen, it, but if you put enough energy into the Higgs field, you can generate a small excited region in that field. And then that excited region breaks apart and you measure the broken apart bits. And that's what gives you the clue that there was a single particle formed. We'll get back to this. Okay, so there's a Higgs boson, which is just a simple excitation of the Higgs field. It's like um, taking a smooth surface of water and slapping the water, and the waves go out. You get a very simple excitation of waves that are expanding from where you slap the water. All right? Just yeah. Um, in the absence of massive particles, as um, yes. is the Higgs field expected to be more or less uniform, or would you expect it to have this continuity to the same way like the cosmic white hole and that numbers? As far as we can tell, as far as the Higgs field is concerned, it's a uniform field. Um, it may not turn out to be a uniform field, but all we know from current standard model predictions and measurements and results is that it appears to be, the implication is that it is a uniform field everywhere. So if it was discontinuous, like you expect some parts to have slightly more than You would expect to see electrons he heavier in one part of the universe than in another part of the universe. But in fact, if we look 10 billion light years away through our telescope, that can't be because we see the same chemistry. We see the same excited states in chemical atoms. The atoms uh, that, that, that we know are out there, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, they have excited states. And if the electron had a different mass, those energy levels would be different and we would be able to detect that because we can measure very accurately. Again, experiment way ahead of theory. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but it was so hot, and the universe expanded so quickly. Well, the universe expanded so quickly that the Higgs field didn't kick in until after the universe had expanded to almost its full size. Um, that was the cosmic inflation, as it's called, and 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 that's a slightly different topic, but. After the inflation stopped, the universe slowed down and then the Higgs field became more important. The temperature associated with the Higgs fields became larger than the temperature associated with the motion of the, of the, of the universe expanding, if you can think that. Isn't that a crazy concept? Mm -hmm. Temperature associated with the motion of the expansion of the universe. But that's, <laughs> and that temperature now is just three degrees. It's, it's three Kelvin. It's the cosmic microwave background radiation temperature. So, Higgs temperature is now, gee, we've just tickled it at, at trillions of degrees, several trillion degrees, and we've just been able to excite um, one of these simple Higgs boson modes, we think, at the Large Hadron Collider by colliding protons together and creating four trillion degree temperatures, five trillion degree temperatures, trillion, all right? That's, that's, a, that's what is that, 10 to the 12. That's a million, million degrees Kelvin, a million, million centigrade. 
Okay. Now, Peter Higgs, he did get some more credit because after he had submitted his paper on this idea that there was a uniform field, the uh, referee didn't like it and said, well, what's the experimental consequence? And he put back, well, there will be a particle associated with this field. And he sent it back in to the publisher, and the publisher published it. So um, that's why this particle is called the Higgs particle, because out of that group of six people who had the same idea, he was the only one who actually wrote back in the paper to say there will be an experimental consequence of this Higgs mechanism. You, it wasn't the Higgs mechanism, it was some fancy name that I'm not even going to mention, but it was some fancy name and there would be an experimental consequence. We would be able to see some kind of particle and it would be very heavy, very, very heavy. Okay. What's very heavy? Well, think of a proton. This particular Higgs particle turns out to be about 125 times heavier than a proton. Um, that's like an atom of tin, I think. A tin atom might weigh the same amount as one Higgs boson. So uh, it's pretty heavy as far as elementary particles go. As far as you and I go, it's, 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 it's nothing. It's, it, like particles of dust weigh less than that, or, or weigh, mu weigh many times orders of magnitude more than that. But for elementary particles, this is a very heavy mass, 120 times heavier, 125 times heavier than a proton. Okay, that's what I mean by heavy in this sense. So, if these particles generated in the Big Bang are traveling and, and inflation stops and the Higgs field kicks in, the particles acquire mass. Now, let me just go back here. So here's my particle traveling in at the speed of light, hits the Higgs field, gains mass, moves more slowly, just like Margaret Thatcher across the field. So the interaction with the Higgs field in this picture, you can think of as friction with a viscous fluid. It slows you down. It does another analogy that the journalists like to hear. Uh, golden syrup, getting stuck in golden syrup, or trying to go through snow. It slows down your progress, or you're walking through water in a swimming pool. It slows down your progress. And that, as, that looks as if you have gotten heavier because you're moving more slowly. Very strange, could this be true? Gentle reminder, fifth form physics, science. fifth form science. And this has been around a long time. People have known about this matter for a long time with atoms for a long time. And, and there's a, there's a, um, a famous poem on the, on the Nature of Things by Lucretius where he mentions that these atoms come in threes. Keep that in mind. It took in the far right picture here on the smallest scale of matter we know. You see three little quarks. Is he ahead of his time or just drunk? I don't know. But you take that matter and you shrink it by about a factor of 100 million a block of wood, and you can just make out now the atoms in that wood, carbon atoms mostly for wood. And you can then, as, as you, then you have to really wait until chemistry began with John Dalton in the mid-19th century, um, and then toward the 20th century, there's the discovery of the electron that goes around the atom, and we have our own person who arguably invented nuclear physics, Ernst Rutherford, who then found that those electrons went around a little hardcore center called the nucleus, and that that nucleus um, was made not just of, had, had, had additional particles inside the nucleus, there were neutrons, 1932, the discovery of the neutron, 1912, uh, Rutherford had actually discovered something called the proton, he could have had a second Nobel Prize for that because he wrote a paper saying, we'll call this singly ionized part of charged particle a proton. No one had distri distinguished it before as an individual particle. He could have won a second Nobel Prize, but there was a lot of politics involved. They figured one Nobel Prize was enough for him. Really, it's history, I can't make it up. Um, and in 1932, there was a neutral particle, kind of like a proton, but it's neutral. So that was a neutron, and so that, 
these were the constituents uh, early in the 20th century, and then finally in the 70s, 1970s, we started to get very high energy electron accelerators, electron accelerators, and then you use the electrons to scatter off of protons and neutrons. And just like Rutherford scattered alpha particles, helium nuclei, off of atoms to deduce that there was a small hard core, and here in the center, Oh, here's my colleague at uh, CERN. He's logged on to Skype. How, about, how nice. Perfect timing. In the 70s, people used high-energy electrons and were able to scatter them off the little hard centers inside individual protons or individual neutrons. And that was the discovery of substructure for proton and neutron, and these things are called quarks. All right? And it turns out that uh, due to various mathematical symmetries, you could um, you had up and down quarks, and you had whole families of quarks, kind of looked like a periodic table. Okay, so um, that's on the order. The protons are in the order of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. The Large Hadron Collider is so energetic that it probes down to sizes a thousand times smaller than an individual proton. So it it, it it's uh, a device that looks at very fine scales, all right, much more than we've ever had before. What is the standard model we've been talking about? Well, you know, there's hydrogen, helium, and lithium, and boron, carbon, and oxygen, and nitrogen in the chemical table of elements. And what physicists like to say is that this is like the chemical table of elements for physicists. All right? You have quarks, you have particles that show up in radioactivity, which we'll call leptons, and you have, we know that forces exist. We can have electromagnetic forces. Two like charges can repel each other. Opposite charges can attract each other. Uh, the quarks inside a nucleus hold strongly onto each other. So there are these various forces uh, that, that must occur. So there are particles that are associated with these forces. And here's the photon, the gamma ray, the photon, which is associated with electromagnetism. All right, so we have this standard model that essentially consists of that. And all of us are essentially made out of quarks, down quarks, and electrons. Because you can make protons out of two up quarks and a down quark. You can make a neutron out of two down quarks and one up quark. Okay, and electrons for changing one proton into a neutron. Um, and these other ones, C, S, T, B, are charm, strange, top and bottom, or truth and beauty. We tried to get truth and beauty in there because that's much nicer than top and bottom, but you know, physicists, we uncultured. And so we need help from the humanities. Um, so we've got uh, a whole three sets of families there of quarks, and each of those families of quarks, up and down, charm, strange, top, bottom, has an associated family of leptons, electron, neutrino, a muon, and, and a neutrino associated with that, another elementary particle that comes flying out of the sun and uh, due to nuclear uh, fusion reactions, and the tau meson and, and tau neutrino. These are just particles that don't appear in your everyday life, but they do exist. Okay? Everyday life is up, down, and electrons, and photons over here. OK, so that gives us a hint at uh, electromagnetic force. The G, what holds quarks together, since we're scientists and not humanists, and we don't use truth and beauty, gluons hold quarks together. Go figure. Gluons. So that's the name. Nuclear fusion in the sun, it's a beta decay. It's a radioactive process um, in which neutrinos, electron-type neutrinos, get emitted during fusion, and eventually you end up with helium. But um, uh, these other particles, Z and W, do the uh, weak interaction force. So we have strong force electromagnetic force, and the weak force. And the Higgs particle was the one thing that was missing out of this standard picture. You can 
people, physicists could describe this model of, of all parts of nature. Most of these particles show up, these two and those two show up in high energy physics collisions and astrophysical conditions. But the one thing that was missing is where do these things get their mass? I mean, we don't understand why they have the electric charges that they do. That's bad enough. But why do they have the masses that they do? Um, each of these particles has a different mass. The neutrino mass is almost zero. It's as close to zero as you can get, but we, know, we have some evidence that it's non-zero. So again, experiments slightly ahead of theory. We don't know why it's non-zero, but it's like there's, we only have an upper limit on the mass. So there's, there's probably one of these, at least two of these guys have <coughs> some mass, some amount of kilograms. And electrons very light. Muon is about 200 times heavier than that. And the same thing for tau on to the muon. Why do they have these masses? Why, if, if they fall, if these particles fall into nice families like this, why are all these masses so disparate? Why are they so different from each other? Uh, why aren't they nice orderly multiples of each other? What, what, what are we missing here? And we need to understand what generates mass. And that's what the Higgs boson mechanism, the Higgs field, does. So that was the missing corner, uh, the cornerstone of the standard model picture. And I think uh, some people would like that, that um, picture because it looks as if it's coming from heaven. <laughs> it does, and I'm, I'm not going to say that word. I will eventually on one of the slides, but it's not the God particle. I'm not going to say that. Oh, I said it. Too bad. <laughs> Remember this man. Remember the yellow circle. This is neither God nor Higgs, Peter Higgs. This is John Ellis. John twisted some arms for me in New Zealand to help get certain officials to see it my way so that we could join at CERN. And he was head, the head of the theoretical physics division at CERN. Now he's a retired professor at, at, at uh, University College London. And what John is doing is wearing a T-shirt that has the equation of the standard model which, predict, which allows us to explain all of the parts of the 4% of the matter that we know. So the top two lines, as he says, this is, uh, it tell us about the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. But now, since 1964, we had to add two more lines that tell us about this Greek letter phi which is the Higgs field. That's been the name given to the Higgs field, the Greek letter phi. So there's a potential added on to the phi, and you take some in calculus, and you learn to take derivatives of phi. And these little y's here are quarks and leptons. They have different couplings to the Higgs field. And so if you drop all these into a differential equation, you get equations that will tell you the equations of motion of the particles through the fields. And they tell you about the forces and the interactions. And the Higgs field itself is this sombrero thing, this Mexican sombrero hat, like potential. Notice that right here at the, at the origin, there's this bump in the Mexican hat, the sombrero. Um, and if I put a, a ball up there, and if, 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 if I could balance it well enough, that ball would stay there. But space and time have quantum fluctuations. They cause the ball to get a little push, the ball rolls down into where it's more comfortable, down here at the point of lowest energy. But if I go down to this point of lowest energy, my Higgs field, the real part and the imaginary part of the Higgs field, is non-zero. It has a non-zero value. Therefore, that means it exists. It's not zero throughout space and time. The, 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 the most likely value for the Higgs field is not zero, but some number. So that's what tells us that the Higgs potential is the same throughout all of space and time. Okay. Thanks, John. All right, standard model. Yeah, this is just the same kind of picture of mass. And, and notice that um, those particles with the quarks and the electrons. Uh, we call them fermions, or Enrico Fermi. They have a quantum mechanical <coughs> property that only comes in half integer steps. And 
bosons, on the other hand, WZ and this alleged Higgs thing, um, are, call, are, are called bosons. They have integer values of this quantum mechanical property. That property is called spin. Well, what is the theory that uh, this particle is typically in gravity? Yes, that, that would be uh, another boson of even higher spin value. And the Higgs boson, uh, um, photons would have a spin of one. The Higgs boson is called a scalar particle. It has spin zero. A graviton would have a spin two. And this is how people try to unite gravity with these other forces, the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force. Because if you notice, gravity was missing up there. There's no gravity, but we know gravity is a force. Gravity is not part of the standard model. It stands alone, and we can't understand why. If we try to make it into a quantum mechanical theory, you need a particle that would transmit the force. And that particle would be the graviton. It would have a spin of two. There are arguments that say it must be that way. But we have not yet been able to detect that, and I don't think we will with our particle accelerators. It's going to take an awful lot of energy to do that, and we may not be able to do that. We may be able to look out in space with telescopes someday or, re or satellites, but we can't tell it from Earth. Okay. Now, the standard model, though, for this 4% of matter that we do know is really good. It's really accurate. If once we measure all the constants we need to measure that we don't understand, like what the electric charge is of an electron, once we put that in by hand, then we can make very accurate predictions of all kinds of bizarre and obscure quantities. But we can make accurate predictions. So we had one missing piece, the Higgs boson. Well, if you're a high energy or nuclear physicist, this is the place where you want to be these days. This is um, Switzerland in the south. The CERN particle accelerator superimposed on the surface. Actually, it's 100 meters underground, <coughs> roughly. Okay, and that is the Large Hadron Collider ring. And protons get accelerated. Uh, our, our experiment, by the way, here's the main laboratory, and our experiment, of course, is 10 kilometers away over there. Uh, on the other side of the ring, you have Lake Le Mans, Lake Geneva, and you have the Jura Mountains in France. And this is where you get your protons, just out of a bottle of hydrogen gas right at the beginning. And they're accelerated, the, the, the hydrogen is broken into uh, protons and electrons and by an electric field. And some of those protons and electrons get fed into these little pre-accelerators here. And then that pre-accelerator injects protons into a super proton accelerator going around here. And then eventually those protons come out of there and are injected in both directions along the Large Hadron Collider. So there's a step of historical accelerators that are left over that are used to inject protons into the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, and this is what the Large Hadron Collider is. It look, looks like it's just a tube of superconducting magnets in the middle, um, 1,600 magnets roughly, 120 tons of liquid helium. That's practically the entire supply in the world is going around keeping these magnets cold. And at each time the protons go around a certain point in the ring, they get a kick in the bottom, which increases their energy. An electromagnetic kick it increases their energy, and they get accelerated up to this obscene amount of the speed of light. And this is what it looks like. This is the idea. All right, the proton beam circle, you get 40 million crossings of proton beams per second. Now, it's not a beam. It's a series of bunches. It's a series of bunches. Um, 1,300 bunches, roughly. Okay? And each of those bunches has about 100, 100 billion protons. Is that right? 10 to the 9th times 2, 10 to the 11th. That's right. 100 billion protons in a bunch about that long. So 100 billion protons in that bunch. And you have about 1,300 of those bunches synchronized going around at the same time. Here we just have two, one bunch going in each direction. And when those bunches cross, bang, sometimes if you're lucky you get a collision. Most of those protons, 100 billion protons in each bunch miss each other. 
most miss, and they go right through each other. That shows you how small protons are. But if you're lucky, occasionally you get a collision, and stuff flies out of the collision. Debris flies out. Just like two cars collide head on, debris flies all over the place. Two protons collide, matter in the form of particles flies out in every direction. And here's a picture, well, it's a, reconst it's a reconstruction of data. So here we've got about 30 different collisions from a bunch, uh, two bunches of protons that have passed through each other. So it's not just one proton colliding with one proton when the two bunches overlap. In this case, the intensity is so great, the number of protons is so great, that we have about 30 collisions. And you can see the points where the protons have collided, the computer can track backwards all the particles that have come out of that collision. And they track backwards to a vertex. And that's how we know what particles belong to what collision. And in this case, we have 30 collisions in one overlap of a bunch, proton bunches. Kind of looks like art. Yeah. Because only 30 or so, or 40 or 20, were actually collide. Well, many more than that collide. These are the only ones that get written to tape, written to computer disk, because they have some interesting properties. I mean, there's a lot of energy that's been kicked sideways. Instead of heading along the beam, a lot of beam energy gets diverted sideways, called transverse energy. And these particular 30 events, um, out of maybe hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of collisions, were selected by the computer as being interesting, as defined by human beings as having a lot of energy going sideways. You're out of here. <laughs> I, I toss people out when I'm in class and their phone goes off. All right, to track these particles, you need a giant detector. You need a giant detector with fine-grained pixels, just like in your cell phone. In fact, take the cell phone and think how big the little uh, pixels are in there, the number of pixels in there, and then scale that up to 200 square meters worth of silicon pixels. That's so many pixels. That's like 60-some million pixels, 66 million pixels in your digital camera. Now, that was a technology in 1994 when it was decided, that let's build this detector. Today, we probably put in hundreds of millions of channels, but we have to freeze the technology to build the accelerator, or else you'd never get anything built. So they froze the technology with 66 million pixels instead of today's value of hundreds of millions that you could have. All right? And our detector is a huge thing, buried underground, 12,500 tons, but it's compact in the sense that it's only 21, well, I'd double that. It's about 40 meters long, but only about 15 meters tall. Okay, so it's a small building. That's, that's a relative term for us. The other detector, Atlas, is gigantic compared to this. Okay, and our detector measures the different particles that come out of those collisions. It measures their energies. We have computer software that selects and records just uh, hundreds of interesting events and writes them to disk. And that's where they're studied offline by, well, everybody who's involved in the collaboration, from students to ancient faculty members. Yeah. So, in theory, yes. like later on, some point in the future, um, when you know all technology advances, advanced so much, is the design of the hadron collider, or the large hadron collider, um, modular enough that the existing detector could be taken out yes. and a new one put in? Yes. In fact, that's what we're doing right now. We're thinking of upgrades to the detector and to the accelerator. So while we're using this current technology from the 2000 or 1990-something, we're going to update that with 2012 technology. Of course, when, when that gets built, it'll be out of date. Okay. <laughs> but it will be better. It, there will be more granularity. We'll be able to see finer, and we'll have better detectors, more efficient detectors, collect data faster, store it better, uh, Sorry, more efficiently. Build a detector like that. Yes. Um, 1994 build to 2008. Do you, do you build it taking into account the advance of computer processing power as well? Because yes, some things are assumed will be invented to solve this particular problem. <laughs> and I always thought that was funny. Yes, the, the material science engineers will, by 2002, 
have invented a particular type of flexible superconductor that we will then wrap around. So yes, there are, <laughs> there are no predictions that you know, <laughs> failure is not an option to use a cliche. There will be this type of material at this point in the project. And so far, everybody's been fearful enough that they met the target. <laughs> yes. That there is a giant hole in the ground. Yeah. That's where these. In fact, there was a previous lower energy accelerator inside this ring that made out of iron magnets, not superconducting magnets, but iron magnets that they ripped out to put in the new superconducting magnets. They did what? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a river. There's a river flowing underneath here. So what they did was pour liquid nitrogen. So much liquid nitrogen they froze the underground water river gave them enough time to seal with concrete the big tunnel underneath and it stopped the leak. No messing around. You just pour, you know, humongous amounts of liquid nitrogen, freeze the water, and then they pour concrete on the inside of your tunnel. We'll see this. Is there the so I have some pictures? Yes. The yes. And so people have, are having ideas. While we're doing physics, there are engineers and other physicists who are thinking, what can I do to improve the problems that these people have now? And they then get together, and there's going to be a shutdown at the end of 2000. And somewhere in 2013, there'll be a shutdown for a year and a half. And all of these great ideas will be implemented into the detectors and into the accelerator. And so by 2015, when it turns on again, we'll have a new and highly improved machine, accelerator and detector. Okay, and if you wonder how big this thing is, well, you might recognize Auckland, and there are a few bays there. This would be the ring of the LHC. You can see there's expressions from Remy Weira here, to Point Chev, and it goes down south, cross bridge, not quite up to Tekapuna, but this is the size of the ring underground, it's 100 meters underground, 27 kilometers of circumference. And this just gives you some kind of scale of, as to how big this would be if we picked it up and we put it down in New Zealand. So why was Geneva text? Like, it strikes me as building a collider next to a river. They didn't know it was there. <laughs> so, uh, because it was, it was uh, one of the least damaged places in the world after World War II. CERN was put together right after World War II to help the Europeans catch up to the Americans in physics. And so 20 nations put together a certain fraction of their gross domestic product towards rebuilding that scientific infrastructure at the laboratory. And that's where CERN originated in the 1950s. And so Switzerland, right on the border between Switzerland and France, seemed to be a nice compromise. They liked the geology, didn't know about the river, but they liked the geology in general. It's flat plain. It's farmland. It's farmland. It looks like Waikato. On the surface, there's sheep and cows. What are and the neighbors saying about this? Nothing. You can't tell it's there. You don't know it's there, except for occasionally, every every ten miles or every ten kilometers or so, you'll see a little, uh, an industrial building, and that will be an entrance to the shaft, 100 meters underground. It'll be an elevator shaft down to the uh, ring. It's it's just I mean corn and wheat are growing. Corn, not wheat, but corn is growing. Uh, um, it's farmland. It's regular farmland. You would not believe it. That's why you have to go there. But these are the really important detectors, because these are ours. These are New Zealand. This is why we're there. Um, and I, I won't spend a lot of time other than to say we have these detectors that are, here's where the beam goes through. The center goes through the beam pipe. And we put these plastic de detectors made out of plastic material that will light up whenever a charged particle goes through. So if a misbehaved proton gets out of its bunch and goes off to the side, it will go through one of our detectors and we'll know that suddenly maybe the beam is starting to misbehave itself. It's starting to, because protons in a bunch like to push each other apart because they all have the same charge. So the beam starts to burst, it starts to diverge after 10 hours or so. And you can actually see this happening because these signals from our detectors start to get bigger and bigger. So when that happens, a signal gets sent to the control room saying it's time to dump this beam and put in fresh protons. And so that's what New Zealand does. We monitor the beam radiation. What causes the beam to diverge? Surely the 
same? Well, sometimes the magnetic fields in all the thousands of magnets going around the ring, will, there'll be a fluctuation in a power supply and a beam won't be steered perfectly through, so some parts of the protons will get out and maybe hit a piece of metal, a metal stand that's holding up the ring, for example, and it will generate radiation. Um, but it's really the, the, the fact that the protons have positive charge and they don't like to be bunched a hundred billion together in a length about this long. They like to push each other apart. And so that's the problem. The beam diverges over time because there's more and more time that they spend pushing on each other. So over 10 hours, the beam is usually, instead of starting off like this, it's suddenly got like this. And the detector people and the operators of the accelerator have to know when that happens because otherwise, if they don't know that has happened, those protons will hit very sensitive electronics, hundreds of millions of euros worth of electronics, and people will be very upset at New Zealand <laughs> for having hundreds of millions of euros worth of electronics destroyed by being hit full force with the energy of the beam. So how do you beat those? Do them up into the air, or...? Uh, we beat them, we, send, we get signals in our detector, and then we send signals size of the signal back to the control room who's running the ring and then when that hits a certain value we say sorry the beam has gotten too big please dump it <laughs> so that and refill again with an, a more better focused narrow beam so we can start the next run but how do they dump it like oh they, they, they just aim it toward uh, a big uh, multi-ton um, block of uh, is it graphite I think so they crash all the beam right into a big chunk of tons and tons of graphite, so it gets very, very hot. A lot of energy gets deposited in the graphite, and, and that's the way it's dumped. So it's a very radioactive site for a while. Okay, that's called a beam dump. It seems like turning a corner, though. It's... Going around the corner, you've got continuous magnets, though, so there's always a continuous correction to keep it. I mean, it's not a perfect circle, but it's as close as they can get to a perfect circle going around the ring because there are 1600 of these magnets and so you have 1600 little kinks in your circle so when I say the ring is circular it really has 16 take a circle and break it up into 1600 kinks and then you get a circular path yeah what happens is that you have an uh, electric field that oscillates. First it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down. And as a proton beam comes from the little red tank of hydrogen atoms at the beginning, uh, some of those protons will experience electric field pushing down on it. So those beams, those will get pushed clockwise. But then the electric field oscillates back up and the next bunch of protons that come along will force and pushes them in the other direction, counterclockwise. So as this oscillating electric field changes direction, protons get kicked either clockwise or counterclockwise. And then they get stored in the smaller ring and then injected into the main ring. And so when they're going clockwise and counterclockwise, the two bunches are only about like this far apart in space, going through two little vacuum pipes. 27 kilometers of vacuum pipes, only about this far apart from each other. One beam going this way, the other beam coming this way. And at four different points, they're slightly bent by magnets so that they two bunches line up and they hit head on. Okay? It's very curious and wonderful technology. <coughs> With the vacuum tubes, there's two vacuum tubes. Yes. Yeah. They're what vacuum is, pipes. There's all the air has been pumped out of them. What's maintaining the speed of the electrons is, is the magnets. Yes, as, 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 as they go around 11,000 times a second, each time they go around, they keep getting a kick in energy. Right. Is there, is there one particular magnet that gives them the kick, or are they being kicked all the way around by each magnet that uh, I think them? I think there yes. are, oh, there are there, that's a complicated question, because there are magnets that do this correcting function to steer them, steering magnets that give them the little adjustments. In the control room, can't do it. It takes a computer program to monitor thousands of magnets to make the simultaneous adjustments to keep the magnet, to keep the beam roughly in its 1600 
sectioned circle. Um, but there is, I think, only one main place where they get a kick clockwise or a kick counterclockwise. And that was the sort of question, the main question that I had, is that if you've got two beams of protons going in opposite directions, mm -hmm. then to kick each of those beams, mm -hmm. it has to be opposing magnetic fields, I think fields, they use two it? different kickers. Two different you could have two different kickers. One kicks clockwise, another kicks counterclockwise. So and they'd be offset in distance, presumably? Like they wouldn't be right next to each other? I can't answer that one. I don't know that one. I don't know exactly where they are, but it makes sense to have one in accelerate in one direction, one to accelerate in counterclockwise direction. Because the other thing How far apart they are, they must, they must be in the same building. They must also know say. relatively where the protons are, so that they yeah. know when to kick these. Yes, too. It's, everything's timed to the trillionth of a second, a fraction of a trillionth of a second. Wow. A thousandth of a trillionth of a second, they can make timing that accurate. Right? But that's just like global satellite positioning. You need highly accurate clocks. Same thing here. No $2 stopwatch. No $2 stopwatches. In fact, <clears throat> this is what it looks like. So these are cosmic rays. Here's our, here's our New Zealand detectors surrounding around a ring here. But these are just cosmic rays coming from outer space. All right, this is, this is data, it's not a simulation. <laughs> um, and you see, now the beam turns on, protons are going along the green beam line, and you see there's this, un, these are, there are these unruly protons somehow have gotten out of the beam pipe, or have hit the, uh, a magnet or something, and, and they produce radiation going forward. And we want to keep that radiation from hitting too much of the detectors electronics inside this cylinder. So this is kind of a normal behavior. There's always some little halo of particles that follows a beam around. But we don't want that halo to get so big that it would start damaging the electronics. And so our job is to look for coincidences at both ends of the detector. And here now we're back, the beam's been turned off. We're back to natural cosmic radiation from space. So that's our job at CECI, 100 meters below the surface. What was the Big Bird thing floating across the bottom? That was Big Bird. <laughs> that was how big Big Bird would be. Remember Sesame Street? Need I say more? Let me just... So 2012 is a really good year, right? We had the Mars rover lander. We have this Higgs thing. It's also Charles Dickens' 200th birthday, so I'm reading our mutual friend, Julia Child's 100th birthday. But more importantly, it's the birth of high energy physics because cosmic rays that we saw in just in the previous movie were measured. Victor Hess flew balloons, high energy, high auditor balloons, and here he is. I love the wonderful caption that goes with this picture. He's surrounded by peasants. Local <laughs> peasants assist Victor Hess in his balloon. Local peasants. And so here are the cosmic rays going through our detector. We can use these cosmic rays to calibrate and exactly align our detector. And here's Victor Hess in his balloon. And that's Mont Blanc uh, in, in, in France. Um, and this is radiation coming from space. It's going through us all the time. So that's why we put the experiment underground to try to shield as much as possible the detectors from this cosmic generated radiation. We're bathed in a sea of cosmic radiation. We, we evolved in this, so we're used to it. So you need a big detector. This is like a fisheye lens view. And there's, you can, there's no people here, but you can see uh, the, the, the railing for people. And this is the 15 meter diameter uh, view. And this is what the t cavern looks like before you put your big detector. The big detector needs a big hole in the ground, an even bigger hole. And this is concrete wall lined after we froze the river with liquid nitrogen. Well, we didn't do it, but it's a royal we. Um, and so all, here are all the services, water, electricity um, that you need, liquid helium source. And you, what you do is lower down a 100 meter shaft each section of this 12,000 ton detector. You assembled it on the surface first to make sure all the parts fit. And you took it apart, lowered each part separately, 
and reassembled it in the bottom, in the hole. And you carefully assemble the big detector. Now here's some people down at the bottom here, give you an idea of the scale. And so here, these parts all fit together. Okay, so what do we see? This is what we see. Well, I see two little blue spots here in this red chamber. This is our CMS detector. These are two bunches of protons. Bang. Two protons have collided. And there's, so I see four white lines and some little bits of yellow, which are other particles that come flying off. The interesting bits are the four bits of yellow, or the four bits of white, because they're telling us something about the Higgs particle. Those are the muons. Come on. That's what we want. No, next. There we go. So the protons collide, produce two of these Z bosons that, that are part of our standard model. And those Z bosons fall apart into other particles that we're good at detecting in the standard model. The muons are very heavy electrons. Mu plus, mu minus pairs, because the plus and minus cancel out and it gives you a neutral Z. So we look for a signature that gives me four muons. What do we just see? This is what we just saw. Four muons in our detector. Two protons coming in, two standard model Z, Z bosons coming out, and each of those Z bosons live a little bit, not very much, like in the octosecond, which is 10 to the minus 23rd seconds. The octosecond is long. Before it falls apart into particles that we're good at detecting, like either photons, gamma rays, or these muons, or pairs of electrons. And our standard model would say, well, we've got two protons colliding, two up and a down quark, held together, glued together by gluons. But of course, nature is always far more complicated than that. And this is what a proton really looks like, more realistic than this. There's pairs of quark and antiquark pairs that form for a brief amount of time, then annihilate each other. This is inside the proton going on. And you see lots of these. And then you see there are lots of gluons inside. And they're interacting with each other. And they're interacting with the quarks. So protons are actually very complicated objects. And, and we like them just because they're easy to get from a hydrogen gas and accelerate. But they're very complicated internally. So how do we know it's colliding? Well, we can only make a prediction from the standard model that one of the likely processes to produce a Higgs particle, and since we're searching for this Higgs excitation is to look for the collision of two gluons, not individual quarks, but two gluons that will collide, say this one and this one, these little wiggly lines, and if they have enough energy, they might be able to have enough energy, E, to create the M, C squared, for the mass of the Higgs particle. And that's the strategy. You slam protons together, look for this process of two gluons colliding, producing energy to produce mass. And here's a gluon-gluon collision going to not just the four muons, but this one goes to two photons. This is our most sensitive channel, the most sensitive uh, way we have of measuring two photons, two gamma rays. And this is what everybody was looking at. If you add up the energy of the gamma rays, because nobody knew what the mass of this particle was, but if you add up the energy of the gamma rays and you do a very careful background subtraction and an incredible amount of statistical analysis and very careful work, you get a beautiful little bump that shows up at about 125, 126 times heavier than a proton. That shows you that here's the background from the standard model prediction, but above and beyond that background, something else exists above and beyond our normal standard model background that we've never seen before. That is our alleged Higgs particle. It's just so beautiful. And if you just look at the raw data, there's just this little bit of upturn at the energy, the number of counts you see 
number of times you see this gamma gamma pair being produced, or mu plus mu minus double pair produced in this case, falls in exactly the same energy as our gamma gamma. So there are two different ways we've seen of how this particle falls apart. Um, this Higgs boson, which is like produced basically by the, uh, by the crash of these two protons, yeah. is it like stable? No. And you can like capture it or trap nope. it somehow? Nope, you can't. You can only see its death. You only know it by its death. You only know it by falling into two gamma rays with an enhanced probability when they, two gamma rays have this <coughs> energy. And you know it by its death by falling into four muons by the enhanced probability of seeing those four muons with a total <coughs> energy of 125. So that, that's the energy released as the mass is converted into Back to energy, yes. And there were a dozen different ways you can create that Higgs thing. It's just that the gamma gamma and this four muon are the most likely ways, the best ways we have for our CMS, compact muon solenoid detector group, and the other group as well, the ATLAS group. Because pe human beings are very good at detecting electrons and muons and photons. So we built the detectors looking for these particular death modes. I hate to call it, yeah, that's an interesting term. We call it a mode of a death mode. We look for these modes of particle falling apart. You can't see the particle itself. You can only see its remainder, its ghost. And uh, I just want to show you, um, there's been some jargon called Brazil plots, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Since the Olympics, I thought I'd put it in. Um, and just shows you that there's this nice bump, um, more than 99.9% sure, right at the Higgs boson energy there. And that is um, gamma gamma results. And the blue line here shows us we've hit something called five standard deviation uncertainty. So that's less than one 3.5 million, one out of 3.5 million chances that there's an error. So that's like if everybody in New Zealand bought a lotto ticket, um, your chance of winning is about one in 3.5 million, one in four million. Um, and if someone and if I won, then this would be wrong, because th th my chance of being wrong here is one in four million, roughly. And so, if I won the lottery ticket, if everybody in New Zealand bought a lotto ticket, and I happened to be the one that won, my chance of winning was one out of four million. So, that's the same probability. My chance of winning is the same probability as this being wrong. Well, I'm never going to win. Practically speaking, I'm never going to win a four million people lotto ticket. Well, it doesn't matter how many other people buy the lotto ticket. I mean, if you've chosen the right number, you're still going to win. Yes, somebody will win. But here, it's it's not quite an exact analogy. If only five people bought lottery tickets tomorrow, it's, um, yeah, yeah. and there's still a chance that someone will win. Yeah. So what you're saying when you say wrong is the probability that these results are due purely to chance and not due to the explosive. That's right are about the same odds as me winning a lotto ticket, if everybody in the country bought a ticket. And here's our Atlas collaborators, they see exactly the same thing. And that's why there are two experiments at every, two experiments at every accelerator. One backs up the other, or one shoots down the other. This is what happens in the U.S. Uh, and other accelerators around the world. You build them in pair, you build your accelerator with pairs of the, the competing detectors. And the director of the lab insisted we wouldn't go public with this until both groups saw five sigma results. Both groups got these one in four million results independently of each other because we don't know what the other guys are doing. We just know they have their data, we have ours, and we unveil it at the same time. And wonder of wonders, everybody got the same answer. Okay. Yeah, but the way these particles have fallen apart so far, this Higgs particle, there seems to be a lot more there seems to be a little bit of anomalous numbers of Higgs to gamma gamma events. So maybe there's that Higgs boson we see is just not a plain vanilla Higgs boson that Peter Higgs thought of. Maybe it's a little brother of a whole family of Higgs bosons. That's what we're looking for now, data that's currently being analyzed and, and, and acquired. And sometime in September, late September, there'll be an update and we'll get more information on whether 
this Higgs boson particle we've seen really is a Higgs boson particle, first of all. And second of all, is it a plain vanilla? Or is it, as this early indication suggests, something that's a family of Higgs bosons? Because Higgs took the very simplest assumption, just one particle, one Higgs boson, that we should see. But nature may not work that way. Nature is far more clever and unusual than we could ever be. So it's consistent with the Higgs boson, the nature of the particle, but we're measuring more data at CERN. This is what it looks like. This is what all my friends look like. My, or this is what my students look like at about 2 o'clock in the morning when there's no beam and you have nothing else to do, so you sit down and you, you work on your data. Okay, so um, we're still, we think we have a handle now on a mechanism for what is mass. It's this interaction with a field that seems to exist everywhere. Um, we're also trying to investigate where the rest of the universe went, <laughs> where the antimatter went, and this is what I like. Nuclear physics, we don't use protons, we slam lead nuclei together. 207 protons and neutrons in each lead atom. And we make a whole crowd of quarks and gluons, a big cloud or soup of quarks and gluons, which was like the early universe, a few microseconds, a few millionths of a second after the Big Bang. So that's what I'm studying. And is there some kind of unification of all these laws of physics that uh, our standard model and gravity? We don't know, but we're investigating right now. And so we'll put Higgs picture up here. There's this equation that was on the t-shirt of the man with the white hair, John Ellis. And he's got his Higgs boson contribution up there. So thank you very much for coming and putting up with me for being late and, and for asking a lot of questions. I thank you very much. Yes. It could. I'll tell you what accelerators do right now. Um, accelerators can take nuclear waste and bombard the nuclear waste with, say, a beam of protons, or you can take that beam of protons, smash it into a target of metal, and get only neutrons flying out. And those neutrons then will hit the nuclear waste and cause it to fission into products that don't have long half-lives, like 10,000 years is a long half-life. But if you bombard it long enough with the neutron beam from a particle accelerator, you can stop, you can reduce the amount of material that has a long half-life. You can get it down to 100 years or less. And so then you have to only hold it for 100 years instead of 10,000 years or a million years. That's work in progress. People can do, this can be done. It's how much money we want to invest in that. Or you can use particle accelerators to generate energy as well. How much money do we want to invest in that? That's right. And some then there's some characteristic of each particle that gives it a different interaction with the Higgs field, yeah. okay. my, which my makes it a different mass. Is like, what, what, is the, what is the physical metaphor in the real world for the popularity of Margaret Thatcher? of the particle. Is it, like, is it like the more electrical charge it has, the more mass it requires, or the more this, or that? I think you might, it might be, well, what's a, the technical term? Um, weak hypercharge, see, I did, weak hypercharge, I think is the term. This is, this is, this what gives, this mechanism was proposed to decide to give mass to W and Z bosons. And people said, okay, if it works for that, it may also be the mechanism that gives mass to electrons or, and, and quarks. But Higgs mechanism wasn't designed for, Higg for quarks and electrons. It was designed to give the very heavy masses of W and Z particles, which are about 80 or 90 times heavier than a proton. Um, and they have the quantity called weak hypercharge. It's a unification of electric charge and weak interaction. 
So now instead of the electromagnetic force and the weak force, we have since uh, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we have the electroweak unified force. So those, two, those forces have been united. The weak radioactivity force and electromagnetism are now really seen to be branches of the same electroweak force. And that's what the Higgs field acts on, this electroweak force. And the unification, we want to put the strong force now together with the electroweak force. And maybe one day add gravity together with the electroweak and the strong. And that would give us the grand unification that so people talk about. So basically the particle before entering the Higgs field is defined, and it's not defined by the mass, it's defined by this certain amount of electroweak force. Yeah, until yeah. It's get and it's not even it's exactly the, the weak on. hypercharge. There, there, there are some other issues as well. It's a pretty complicated way, but I, I, I think I could just say there's a different type of electric charge that the Higgs field acts on that generates mass instead of electric charge. Yeah. So the theory then doesn't predict the specific values of the mass? No, we want to know why. Now that we think we know the, have the evidence of the mechanism, we, we want to try to understand why each of the particles then has the mass that we do measure, now that we're sure of the mechanism. Um, the atmosphere, there was the, the spike at the energy of the Higgs, but then afterwards, um, oh, there I think it was the expected value went quite flat, and the other one dipped. Was that dipped at the end, like the high, high energy of the Higgs axis? Like from 135 upwards, why are they separating? Um, what, the, the red lines or the blue lines? The, the, for example, the dotted lines going lower than the uh, solid lines. Uh, I think they were standard model, let's see, they were standard model predictions. Dashed lines are predictions of pure standard model. And so um, that would be like the background. And so we see signals that are stronger or, uh, this is a local, well, I, I don't want to explain what the P naught value is, but whenever it's, it's, it dips below what you expect, then you get a real event. Okay, and we see that happening here, and it's happened here for December 2011 when I was in the audience, and I was hoping they would have announced the discovery then, but they didn't. I was, six, I was seven months too late taking my sabbatical, so I didn't get to be there for the Higgs boson announcement when they gave me this. We only had the green one in December, and then in, uh, in 4th of July they had the red one. So that's just more and more data being accumulated. My pleasure. I don't know. The field that through that, that through which quarks interact with each other. Um, has yet another charge called color charge, red, blue, and green colors. So there are three different kinds of charges that they exchange. But why there is an up quark and a down quark paired up with a charm quark and a strange quark and then a top quark and a bottom quark, we don't know. We don't know why the universe works that way. For some reason, it does work that way. And there are other measurements that show there are only these three families but there's nothing that tells us what the difference is, why one quark is an up quark and another is a down quark. So how, how like, they, you know, uh, actually, they can oscillate back and they can oscillate back and forth. They might be able to fluctuate. Uh, quantum mechanical fluctuations could cause a change in identity of the quarks. But I don't think that's really a satisfactory. Uh, like inside of person, mm -hmm. how is it known that there are two up? Well, the up quark would have um, two th a fractional charge, for example, plus two thirds charge. So if you have plus two thirds and plus two thirds, that's plus four thirds. And if you have the down quark, that's minus one third. So four thirds minus one third gives me three thirds, or plus one for the charge of a proton. 
This was this was all worked out in in the sixties and seventies by a fellow named Murray Gelman, who noticed very strange uniformities in the properties of hundreds and hundreds of elementary particles that got produced in cosmic ray experiments. And he looked for an underlying pattern, and he found this beautiful pattern, the eight, eightfold way, he called it, which is another seminar. Yeah, that's what that's that's what it is for so physicists. Yeah, but we think we're stuck with the, the, with what we have here now, though. With, with periodic table, you keep you can, there are still predictions you can get islands of even heavier stable nuclei, and people still discover new super heavy nuclei every so often. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They saw a zoo of so many particles, and people said, just like chemistry, there must be an underlying order. And Murray Gelman won a Nobel Prize for coming up with this system of up and down quarks. Um, pop culture always has been a thing, but I was told that the, um, the person recording the Higgs God particle right. actually wanted to record that goddamn particle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wouldn't get away with that in the States, though. So they need to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> Leon Letterman, the man who wrote the book, um, is kind of a character anyway. I mean, he's a great teacher and communicator, but he's kind of a character. And so I can just imagine, I can, it's totally in character with him for, for, to do this, just because that's the way he is. Yeah. Uh, if, if the Higgs is really all we get out of the... CMS and Atlas for the next few years, we don't find anything more exciting like super symmetry and, oh, and the rest of it. Boy. Are governments still going to be willing to, to fund it on such large scale, large, large scales? I suspect they might. I suspect that just like ideas can be proven wrong, it doesn't mean that there aren't other ideas that are correct. And the, this accelerator was built to look for the Higgs boson and to look for another type of symmetry in nature called supersymmetry. And there's no evidence yet of supersymmetry. In fact, it's not looking good for the simplest models, but the more sophisticated models. And nature might just be more sophisticated than this, the simplest possible things that we can think of, humans can think of. Nature may just be more sophisticated in the way it does things. And so. That's why we're pushing on now, and, and I think that's the kind of argument people might make if you only find the plain vanilla Higgs particle. And the governments will be tolerant of that? Okay. They have been so far, um, but this is just 4% of the matter we know of. There's still, think of the dark matter. We should be able to create energy, which generates mass, which generates gravity. So we should be able to create somehow these dark matter particles, but we couldn't detect them right now because they don't interact with our detectors. They, they, they can fly right off. We could be creating them every day, but not know it because they don't like to interact with our detector material. So the next generation might be some clever new kind of de dark matter detectors, which already exist at the bottom of mines around the world. Maybe we'll use some of them, move them close to the collision proton zone instead of just leaving them down in the center of the earth, under coal mines somewhere, or gold mines, maybe we'll put them close to our um, CMS or Atlas detectors, and we'll have something that might be able to have a shot at seeing a dark matter particle. So we just know very little. We know a lot, but about very little. Why can't you detect dark matter? Does it not have a mass? It does, and it, so gravity is the only way it does interact. It's called dark matter because we can't see it because it doesn't scatter visible light or any other kind of electromagnetic radiation. So it doesn't interact with electromagnetism. Who knows what it does with the weak interaction because we don't have any to measure with the weak interaction or the strong interaction. But it does have gravitational effects because it does keep the galaxies together as it rotates around. Oh, it should be concentrated in the center of the sun right now. And, and anywhere there's big globs of mass, like the Earth, should be concentrated at the center of the Earth. And that's why we put these dark matter detectors at the
the bottom of mines to keep them away from cosmic rays and in the hope that a dark matter particle will have some very small probability of interacting with the dark matter detector. We just had a big uh, workshop on that last month at Auckland on dark matter detectors and high energy physics detectors. Yeah. So what was detected was more a field and an interaction between the dark 